Hi, my name is Aaron Wilson Wright, and I will be presenting a paper entitled Life and Happiness, a Petitionary Reading of the Wadi El Hol Inscriptions. The two inscriptions from Wadi El Hol constitute some of the earliest known alphabetic texts. Although David Vanderhoeft has recently proposed a plausible partial reading of the vertical inscription, hereafter Wadi El Hol II, the horizontal inscription remains poorly understood for a variety of reasons. Chief among these is the identity and alphabetic value of the 13th sign. Shaped like a cowrie shell, this letter does not have any obvious descendants among later alphabetic scripts from which to ascertain its phonetic value. In this paper, I argue that sign 13 represents the sun, proto-Semitic thamps, and had the acrophonic value hl. I then exploit this new identification, coupled with a reinterpretation of signs 10 and 16, to provide a reading of the inscription as a whole. According to my interpretation, the author asks a deity for life on behalf of a group of people passing through the wadi. The two alphabetic Wadi Ahol inscriptions were discovered in 1995 during an epigraphic survey along the Farshut Road, an Egyptian military road linking Thebes and Hu. In the Aditio Princeps, John Darnell et al suggests that Semitic-speaking soldiers executed these inscriptions while patrolling the wadi with a military detachment. They also suggest that these soldiers may have operated under the command of Bebi, general of the Asiatics, who left two Egyptian inscriptions in the wadi himself. Based on this contextual link to Bebi, they date the two alphabetic wadi Ahol inscriptions to the reign of Amenemhat III, who ruled from 1853 to 1809 BCE. Although Darnell et al. offer a detailed paleographic analysis of the two alphabetic inscriptions in their edition, they do not attempt to interpret them linguistically. They did, however, publish several photographs of the inscription produced by the West Semitic Research Project, which are available on Inscriptifact. These photographs form the basis for my interpretation. For the most part, I agree with the paleographic conclusions of Darnell et al. But in the case of signs 10, 13, and 16, I would like to offer my own analysis. Sign 10 consists of four or five zigzagging strokes. Darnell et al. identify sign 10 as a mem, but leave open the possibility that it may be a thon. Gordon Hamilton compares it to the more tightly packed mems in the rest of the inscription, and the mem in Wadi Ahol II, which contain between six and nine strokes. Based on this comparison, he concludes that the third downstroke is either a stray mark or damage in the rock face, and that sign 10 should be read as a thon. Although Hamilton's paleographic assessment appears correct, I would like to suggest that this sign could represent S in addition to th. In the early alphabetic inscriptions from Sarabid al Khadam, the letter thon has the value th. The letter S, on the other hand, is represented by a separate letter in Sinai 357 and perhaps Sinai 353 which takes the form of an isosceles triangle with a diagonal stroke protruding from its right side. This is number two on the handout. The value of this sign is secure as part of the votary phrase, because he heard my utterance, ki same imri, as I demonstrate in a forthcoming publication. In all later Northwest Semitic script traditions, however, this letter was lost due to a merger of the phonemes s and th in a later language or languages. I propose, therefore, that this merger also occurred in the language of the Wadi El Hol inscriptions, or at least in the language of its parent script, making it possible to read the noun Napsu, life, in the middle of the inscription. Sign 13 re resembles a cowrie shell. This is number three on the handout. It is a slightly flattened circle bisected by a diagonal stroke. It does not have any clear parallels in either the early alphabetic inscriptions from Sarabid al Khadam or later alphabetic scripts. Darnell et al. compare it to uh, certain semi-cursive forms of hieroglyph N5, which depicts the sun disk, and suggest on this basis that it had the acrophonic value shamshu, meaning sun. They further suggest that sign 13 may be a biform of the S found in Sinai 357, both of which failed to survive in later alphabetic scripts. While the paleographic analysis advanced by Darnell et al. seems plausible, the acrophonic value they propose for this letter requires revision. The proto-Semitic word for sun does not begin with s, but with the voiceless lateral fricative hl, 
uh, as I will demonstrate now. Therefore, I suggest that sine 13 had the value hl, which does not have a representative letter in the early alphabetic inscriptions. This conclusion receives paleographic support from the old North Arabian script Thamudic D. The Semitic terms for sun display two different consonantal reflexes, shamps and samps. This is number four on the handout. The former occurs in Old South Arabian and Arabic, while the latter appears in Biblical Hebrew. Aramaic presents mixed evidence. In Old Aramaic inscriptions, the divine name Shamash is written with a shin, which can represent both etymological s and etymological fl. But Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian transcriptions of Aramaic names containing Shamash render the initial consonant as either t, sh, or ilt, which suggests a lateral realization of this phoneme in early dialects of Aramaic. So it was probably a fl as well. Later Aramaic dialects, like Syriac, continue to write the initial letter with shin, but write words with etymological fl with semkath, a different letter. This orthographic convention suggests that earlier Aramaic hlamash had shifted to shamash by the time Syriac is first attested, most likely due to progressive assimilation. Ugaritic and Akkadian do not provide evidence either way. In both languages, etymological s and etymological fl merged into a single consonant. Given the distribution of these forms across the Semitic family, it is more parsimonious to reconstruct the proto-Semitic word for sun as flamps with an initial fl. If the proto-Semitic word for sun originally began with s, then the Arabic, Old South Arabian, and Old Aramaic forms must have undergone parallel processes of dissimilation with later dialects of Aramaic preserving the original phoneme. If, on the other hand, the proto-Semitic word for sun began with fl, then only the Hebrew and later Aramaic dialectal forms need to have changed due to progressive assimilation. Thus, it is more likely a priori that flamsu was the acrophone for sign 13. The Old North Arabian script, Thamudic D, provides a final, albeit tentative, piece of evidence for identifying sign 13 as hla. This is number five on the handout. In this script, the sibilant S2, which renders etymological hla, in other words, is represented by a sunburst. Paleographically, this letter doesn't match sign 13. But it is possible that a later writer remodeled it on the basis of its acrophonic name, after the original sign had lost its pictographic character and connection to hieroglyph N5. Given the already abstract character of sign 13, this could have happened soon after the spread of the alphabet to the Arabian Peninsula. If this is the case, then the Thamudic D S2 represents a survival of both the sun pictograph and the acrophone Famsu in a later alphabetic script. There are several issues with this hypothesis, however, uh, that I should bring up. First, it is unknown whether the Old North Arabian scripts preserved acrophonic names for the different letters. Second, the date of the Thamudic D inscriptions is unknown. They could date over two millennia after the Wadi Ahol inscriptions, rendering a connection between the two letters tenuous. Third, the Old North Arabian scripts contain several letters which have the basic form of a square or circle surrounded by rays. Because of this, the comparison between sign 13 and Thamudic D S2 must remain inconclusive. Sign 16, number 6 on the handout, is faintly inscribed, due most likely to the difficulty the writer had in accessing the left-hand portion of the rock face. It consists of a roughly square body fronted by a series of four or five undulating strokes. Darnell et al. identify it as a raish and compare it with the more distinct resh at the beginning of the inscription and the resh from Wadi al-Hol II. This comparison is not particularly convincing, however. While the other two letters represent a head in profile, sign 16 lacks the separate rounded quaff and angular facial features common to these letters. Instead, I propose identifying sign 16 as a variant of cough. Formally, it resembles the cough from Sinai 365 rotated 90 degrees to the left. The square body of sign 16 corresponds to the trapezoidal body of this cough, and the undulating lines which front it correspond to its stubby triangular fingers. 
Both letters appear to represent a three-fingered hand without a thumb. With these letters, I read the inscription as Rabu Lina Maniha Nafsa Hua Thamechaka, which translates to, O Lord, appoint life for us, if or because, understood, it pleases you. This is number seven on the handout. Syntactically, the inscription consists of two clauses in a paratactic relationship. The final clause contains an imperative directed towards a deity, while the second clause contains a verb in the perfect, which most likely outlines the felicity conditions of this request. Furthermore, the content of the inscription fits the context proposed by Darnell et al. for the use of the alphabet at Wadi el Hol. It requests divine protection in the form of life on behalf of a group of people, perhaps soldiers, during the dangerous passage through the Wadi perhaps as part of military patrol. The inscription presents three linguistic peculiarities which deserve further comment. A, the use of the root MNY with an abstract noun as a direct object. B, the proleptic suffix on the imperative mani. And C, the use of the masculine singular demonstrative hu a to refer to general circumstances. In the first clause of the inscription, the supplicants ask the deity to, quote, appoint life for us, lina maniha napsa. Normally in the Semitic languages, the root mny in the d-stim refers to the allocation of concrete objects or political office. Within the Hebrew Bible, however, the verb mana, a cognate to the root mny in the d-stim, can occasionally refer to the appointment of abstract concepts. This is number eight on the handout. As part of an extended prayer on behalf of the king in Psalm 61.7, the speaker asks God to, quote, appoint faithfulness and truth to guard him, chesed ve'emet man yitzruhu. The biblical name Yimna, found in Genesis, Numbers, and Chronicles, provides indirect evidence for the use of mana with abstract concepts. Uh, this is number nine on the handout. Most likely, it is a shortened form of the name Yahweh appointed with an unexpressed direct object pertaining to the individual's fate. Presumably, this object was an abstract noun, since it is hard to imagine the deity appointing a concrete object to mark the individual's birth, or appointing a newborn baby to political office. The Akkadian verb shamu, to appoint, provides a helpful semantic parallel to this usage of mana in Hebrew. Uh, these are numbers 10 and 11 on the handout. It refers both to the appointment of individuals to political office and the bestowal of abstract benefits. Compare, quote, Enlil has appointed you to be king over the people, end quote, with, quote, he appointed power for her, end quote. The final he on maniha represents a proleptic suffix referring to the following object, napsa. Typically, proleptic suffixes do not immediately precede their reference. But Nama Patel has documented similar constructions in Gez, Classical Arabic, and Biblical Hebrew. In Exodus 2.6, for example, a proleptic suffix on the verb anticipates the definite direct object hayeled. This is number 12 on the handout. Vatirehu et hayeled, and she saw the boy. Patel notes that this phenomenon tends to be more common in languages that lack a definite article, as the language of the Wadi Ahol inscription presumably did and further suggests that it may be a strategy for marking definiteness. Within the context of the inscription, the masculine distal demonstrative hua refers to the circumstances surrounding the act of petition. If the second clause is understood as conditional, then hua most likely refers to the felicity conditions assumed by the first clause. The deity will grant the supplicant's life if and only if it pleases him. Semantically, this makes sense. Syntactically, however, the use of the masculine demonstrative is peculiar here. Normally in the Semitic languages, the feminine distal demonstrative, hia, refers to vague or general circumstances outside of the discourse, as in Judges 14.4, number 13 on the handout. Quote, his father and mother did not know that this, he, was from Yahweh, end quote. As Walt Keen O'Connor point out, however, the masculine distal demonstrative can occasionally assume this function as in the Kare of Psalm 7316. This is number 14 on the handout. Quote, when I tried to understand all this, it, who, was troublesome in my eyes, end quote. The genre of the inscription also deserves context. 
con comment. As far as I know, there are few, if any, petitionary inscriptions in a Northwest Semitic script and language. Most Northwest Semitic inscriptions that directly address the divine are commemorative. That is, they record the fulfillment of a vow after the deity has granted the supplicant's request. A mid-3rd century BCE Punic inscription from Sicily, for example, declares, quote, For the Lord Baal Hamon, that which Chano, son of Adonibal, son of Ger Ashtart, son of Adarbal, vowed, because he heard his voice, may he bless him, end quote. In this and similar inscriptions, the lexical and semantic content of the original petition goes unmentioned, subsumed in the stock phrase, because he heard my voice, which makes it impossible to tell whether any supplicant asks for life. Egyptian personal names like D. Ptah Anek, Ptah gives life, show that deities could grant their followers life. This is number 15 on the handout. But specific analogs to the horizontal Wadi Ohol inscription are limited to Wadi Ohol itself. Wadi Ohol 2, number 16 on the handout, provides the closest parallel to the horizontal Wadi Ohol inscription. In a recent article, David Vanderhoof has per persuasively argued that the first four letters can be read as Mahartaru, petition, a noun with cognate verbal forms in Ugaritic and Hebrew. He also suggests that the last four letters of the inscription form the personal name of the supplicant, Bcharu Ili. The middle four letters, read by Darnell et al. as He, Ein, Wau, Tav, remain uninterpreted. Logically, they should form a verb in construct with Mkhartaru, or Pcharu Ili's title, so that the inscription would read either the petition that Pcharu Ili made, or the petition of Pcharu Ili, and then his title. In any case, the content of the petition is not expressed in writing. But it is expressed graphically. Whoever executed the inscription also incised a large onk on the rock surface. Within Egyptian iconography, the onk served as a general symbol for life, and as Orly Goldwasser has shown, Semitic speakers understood the semantic content, if not phonetic value, of the onk hieroglyph. It was the visual equivalent of Napsu in the horizontal inscription. Thus, Wadi Ahol II records a similar petition for life expressed both verbally and pictographically. As Vanderhoeft concludes, quote, the supplication, therefore, would have been for the life of the individual or his group as they traversed the dangerous Wadi path, end quote. Wadi Ahol 45, number 17 on the handout, a short Egyptian text from the late Middle Kingdom provides an additional parallel to the horizontal Wadi Ahol inscription. The first line reads, Sagebu son Ren Seneb, may he be given life and stability. D. Anak Jed. Although the agent of benefaction goes, men goes unmentioned in this inscription, the sentiment is similar to that of the horizontal Wadi Ahol inscription. Indeed, the request for life in the horizontal inscription may reflect Egyptian cultural influence on the Semitic speaking individuals who traverse the Wadi. Inspired by their Egyptian companions, they may have begun requesting life in their own inscriptions, rather than other blessings that we could imagine, such as safe passage. To conclude, so far the horizontal Wadi Ohol inscription has gone uninterpreted. In this paper, I have proposed a new reading of it by identifying sign 13 as a hl, and reinterpreting signs 10 and 16. According to my interpretation, it records a petition for life from a group of Semitic speakers, perhaps soldiers, as they traverse the dangerous Wadi Road. In terms of genre, it finds its closest parallel in Wadi Ahol 2 and Wadi Ahol 45, which is written in Egyptian. The similarity between the alphabetic Wadi Ahol inscriptions and Wadi Ahol 45 hints at a larger process of transculturation between Egyptians and Semitic speakers that no doubt took place along the Wadi Road. This, in turn, contributes to our understanding of the use of the early alphabet within its Egyptian context. Thank you.